the reason we need to define stresses and strains instead of just figuring out internal forces within a structure, like we used to do in a statics course or even a physics course, is because a force can affect two distinct structures very differently, depending on their geometry and the material they're made of. For example, for bending, with the exact same force, or more precisely, with the exact same bending load, you can easily bend a plastic fork, but barely bend a metal fork, even if they have the exact same geometry. Similarly, the same load can noticeably bend a long and skinny fork, and hardly bend a short and thick one. So again, overall deformation, or any strain-related metric in general, is not about the force, load, moment, or torque only. We have to account for both material properties and geometry. More importantly, going back to the plastic versus metal fork example, if we want to find the load needed for the metal fork to reach the deflection of the plastic fork, we might find that the required forces are so high that the metal fork would yield or even break before reaching the desired deflection. In this case, again, it's not about the loads, but the stresses the material is subjected to. For these reasons, the Mechanics of Materials course focuses on understanding how to calculate the stresses for the four main types of loading, axial, torsion, bending, and transverse shear, together with their associated deformations. Axial loading will cause stresses that we defined as normal stresses, for which we use the Greek letter sigma. The word normal refers to the direction of the stresses with respect to the surface of the cross-section area it affects. All normal stresses are therefore normal, or in more mundane words, perpendicular to the surface. These normal stresses contrast shearing stresses, which are those that are parallel to the surface of the cross-section area. But more on that later, link below. Normal stresses due to axial loading are defined as P over A, where P is the load in the direction of the axis of the structure or member, for example a rod, a beam, or a column, and A is the area of the cross-section at any given location along the axis of the member. Members can have a variable cross-section area along their axis, and this general definition would still hold true. But for most of the structures we analyze here, we'll have members, or worst case scenario, sections of members where the area is constant along the axis. Normal stresses are defined as positive if the load P is generating a tensile stress, that is, a stress that is trying to elongate the axis of the member, and negative if the load P is generating a compressive stress, which is a stress that tries to compress the axis of the member. A very important concept to note here is that the sign of the load P that we obtain from our statics slash mechanics analysis will not determine if the stress is tensile or compressive. The frame of reference and positive axis orientations of our Cartesian coordinate system can very well be set up so that a negative force in one of the three axes can still be generating a tensile stress on a member. We'll take a look at this in more detail with this video's example and the additional example videos from the links in the description below. Even though we'll come back to this during the axial loading deformation video, link below, the normal strain is defined as the ratio of the deformation delta over the length of the member, and we use the Greek letter epsilon for it. This is important to define now, because the reason we define and use stresses instead of just loads, like we mentioned at the beginning of this video, is so we can both experimentally quantify and therefore compare the properties of a material to the stresses a member is subjected to. Specifically for purely normal stresses, these main properties are the yield strength and the ultimate strength. When a tensile stress specimen, which can either have a round cross-section and threaded shoulders, or be flat and have serrated grips, is subjected to a tensile stress, which is positive, remember? We see that as the load, and therefore the stress increases, the deformation, and therefore the strain, increases with it. For metals, ceramics, and some polymers, during a first stage, we see that this relationship is linear. We call elastic modulus the property of the material that gives us the ratio between the stress and the strain which is the slope of that linear section. This will be important later when we find an expression for the deformation delta. For metals, specifically, we find that when this relationship is no longer linear, the material will deform plastically, which means permanently. The stress for which the material goes from the elastic to the plastic region of deformation is what we call the yield strength. 
More specifically, the yield strength is the stress for which the resulting plastic deformation, after removing the load, is 0.2% strain. The ultimate strength is the highest value of the stress registered during the tensile test, and it's usually associated with the material breaking, but more on that later. This is all, of course, a very summarized explanation of all there is to a stress-strain diagram, and we will study it in more detail later, but for now, relating to axial loading, this is all we need. One last concept worth pointing out now is that for most engineering applications, we use engineering stress and engineering strain. True stress is defined as the load over the instantaneous area or the area at any given point, as opposed to the engineering stress where the area we use for the calculation is the initial area or the area of the cross section before any deformation takes place. Since, for example, during a tensile test of a common material, and by common I'm referring to a material with a Poisson's ratio lower than one half, more in Poisson's ratio later, the area will shrink, making the instantaneous area lower, and therefore the true stress higher than the engineering stress. True strain is defined as the integral of dl over l, as it should account for the deformation or the infinitesimal changing length dl over the current length l at any given point. From the initial length l0 to the length of the specimen l, this integral becomes the natural log of l over l0, which even though it's not obviously clear, it is in fact higher than the value of delta over l0 of the engineering strain. Looking at the difference between these two, engineering and true curves, we would see that the values for stress and strain are, like it was just explained, higher than those for engineering values. And since the cross-section area is becoming smaller as the specimen is subjected to tension, we usually see that in the true stress-strain curve, the stresses don't go down at some point, like they do with engineering stress-strain curves. Now, since engineering stress and strain is what we commonly use, we don't talk about a naught or l naught but rather just A and L, and those will always refer to the initial values of the area and the length for the undeformed geometry. Let's now look at a simple example where we make use of these concepts. For a simple structure composed of two members AB and BC, if member AB has a rectangular cross-section and both members are made of aluminum, will member AB deform elastically, plastically, or break if there's a vertical load located at B. Before watching the solution to this problem, try pausing this video and trying it out yourself. And try doing the same for the additional example videos from the links in the description below. To solve this problem, we know that we need to calculate the normal stress due to axial loading and compare it to the material properties. To calculate that stress, we'll need to find the internal force of member AB. Remember how I said that our frame of reference will not necessarily be the same as the Cartesian coordinates we use for the system? I will first make some assumptions about the directions of the vectors of the forces, but after finding the solution to this question, I will go back and explain in detail. If we draw a free body diagram of pin B, which is the same as using the joint method for finding the forces of the members, I will assume that the direction of the force from A to B that is opposing the external load of 144, and will do the same for force CB. The sum of forces in the y direction will have a positive 144 and negative values for the components of the other two forces, the vertical length over the hypotenuse for both cases. And since pin B is not moving up or down, this sum of forces is equal to zero. From a sum of forces in the x direction, we'll have a positive component of the force FAB and the negative value of the x component of the force FCB. And again, since pin B is not accelerating left or right, the sum of forces is zero. Solving for FCB and substituting this value in the sum of forces of Y, we find that force AB is equal to 45 kilonewtons. Using this value and the area of a rectangle with the appropriate units, we find that the stress is 10 megapascals. However, Notice that this stress is a compressive stress, because if this is the free body diagram for pin B, then the free body diagram for member AB would show the reaction force FBA as the reaction force in the opposite direction, 
and this clearly shows that member AB is subjected to a compressive axial load. For this reason, the stress is not 10 MPa, but minus 10 MPa. As long as you can properly draw the free body diagrams of the members subjected to axial loads, the sub-indices that you use for the forces don't need to follow any convention. These sub-indices will however be very important when we talk about torsion. However, a simple trick for axial loading is to assume that the direction of the internal forces is positive so that if the value is in fact positive, the stress being positive will mean that it's a tensile stress. And if the value is negative, it means that the stress is a compressive one. Making this assumption from the beginning, in this case, means that the free body diagram for the pin, or the joint B, had a force FBA going towards the top left of the screen. The X component would be negative, and the Y component would be positive, which means that the resulting stress has a negative sign for the numerical value you found. Whatever the case is, since 10 MPa is lower than 276 MPa of the yield strength, we know that member AB is within the elastic range, meaning it's deforming elastically. For more examples of axial loading, including some normal strain calculations, make sure to check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.